this lesson, we're going to be discussing how SSL and TLS are going to use all the cryptographic tools we've discussed so far in this module. Now, a lot of what we've discussed so far seems like they sort of overlap just a little bit. The purpose of this lesson is to clearly delineate everything we've discussed so far so you understand how they all fit together in the actual SSL and TLS world. So this will serve as a mini review of what you need to have learned so far. It all started when we discussed that SSL and TLS have three main purposes. The first is to provide confidentiality, which is to say that data is only accessible by the client and the server. The second is to provide integrity, which is to make sure that data cannot be modified between the client and the server. And finally, to provide authentication, which means we know indeed who we are speaking to. These three services are provided by different cryptographic tools. Confidentiality is provided via encryption, integrity is provided via hashing, and authentication is provided via the PKI. Then we discussed three different cryptographic tools. We discussed hashing, and within hashing, we talked about how you can use hashing to create a fingerprint of a message. We also discussed message authentication codes, or MAX, which was the idea of combining a message with a secret key when ca calculating that digest. We discussed that MAX provide integrity for data. We also discussed that MAX provide authentication because the other side must have the same key that you do. Now, little caveat, this is going to depend on how those keys are generated. Either way, we then talked about symmetric encryption. And symmetric encryption can really only be used for one thing. That one thing is encryption for the purpose of providing confidentiality. Both MAC and symmetric encryption require secret keys on either side. Well, lucky for us, we showed you how we can use asymmetric encryption to facilitate a key exchange, which you can then use to establish shared keys, which you can then use to provide confidentiality, integrity, and authentication via symmetric encryption and a message authentication code. We also discussed a few other things you can do with asymmetric encryption, namely signatures. We talked about how you can use signatures to provide integrity and authentication for which you have signed. We also talked about how you can indeed use asymmetric encryption for encryption for the sake of providing confidentiality. Now notice we have one set of confidentiality, integrity, and authentication there, and another set of confidentiality, integrity, and authentication there. The difference between these two is this top set is ideally used for bulk data protection, and this bottom set is ideally used for limited data protection. That is how everything we have discussed so far ties together and where the boxes are which delineate each concept. If you followed everything we've discussed so far, you are now ready to understand how SSL and TLS are gonna use these cryptographic tools to secure data. It's gonna start with the client and the server. In this case, the server is the website blue.com and the client is gonna be one of these web browsers. The client and the server intend to share bulk data with each other, and they want to do so in a secure way, which means they want to apply symmetric encryption to get confidentiality to that bulk data, and they want to apply a message authentication code to that bulk data to get integrity. Now, both of these things require mutual secret keys. So before we can do any of these, we have to establish symmetric keys. And we learn that you can use asymmetric encryption to facilitate a key exchange in order to establish symmetric keys. So we need our server to get a set of asymmetric keys so that the client and the server can use those keys to then establish symmetric keys on either side of the wire in order to get confidentiality and integrity. You're probably noticing by now we're missing something. We're missing authentication. The thing is, anybody in the world can generate asymmetric keys. You've likely used the commands on Linux boxes or routers or firewalls that generate keys. Anybody can do that. At this point in time, all the client knows is that the other side of the wire has the same symmetric keys. The client still doesn't actually have confirmation of who the other side is. Again, anybody can generate asymmetric keys. That is where the certificate authority comes into play. The certificate authority is an entity that is trusted by the client. And the certificate authority is gonna generate a certificate. This certificate that the certificate authority generates is going to link a particular set of keys 
to an identity. This certificate is essentially going to say, hey, whoever owns the correlating private key to this public key is definitely Plu.com. Now notice that certificate is signed by the certificate authority. The signature is created by the certificate authority and the client trusts the certificate authority. Therefore, since the certificate is signed, we have authentication for the certificate itself. The client can know that the content of the certificate is unmodified since the certificate authority saw it. Well, since the client trusts the CA, and we know for a fact that this certificate has not changed, the asymmetric keys that the certificate validates an identity for also inherit the authentication that the certificate had from the CA, which means any symmetric key we derived from the asymmetric keys that had authentication also inherit that authentication, which means anytime we are doing a message authentication code with symmetric keys that have been derived from authenticated asymmetric keys also provide the service of authentication. That is how SSL and TLS provide both confidentiality, integrity, and authentication to data on the wire. Notice all three of the key players, that is the client, the server, and the certificate authority were crucial in making this work. Those three key players actually form a triangle known as the PKI or the public key infrastructure. And we'll be picking apart what the public key infrastructure is in the next lesson. The main takeaway from this lesson is understanding what you see on your screen right here. If you followed with how SSL and TLS used all the different cryptographic tools to attain symmetric keys, which can then be used for confidentiality and integrity and authentication, then you're ready to move on to the next lesson. Otherwise, that's it for this lesson. I hope you enjoyed this video. I want to thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Hey YouTube, if you enjoyed that lesson, then you'll also enjoy the full course that it came from, Practical TLS. It's a deep dive into SSL and TLS, taught methodically and intentionally, full of easy illustrations and in the simplest way possible. You'll get to learn cryptography, certificates, private keys, the handshake, OpenSSL, and everything you need to become an SSL expert. To learn more, check out pracnet.net slash TLS. And if you need more convincing that this is the best TLS training course, then check out the other free lesson previews on YouTube. Thank you and have a great day.